I have a poem titled The Governance System. A gentle system feeding light. Precious lives sleep into night. Memories like mist disperse. Governance tumbles. So soft clouds gather in the sky. Our whispers grow, no longer shy. Thunder rumbles, born from hearts. As change, inevitable starts. Not a plea, but a decree. Action blooms like a spring tree. Hand in hand, will well, the right, the wrong, and sing a better, bold, strong, the voice of a Kenyan youth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you for this wonderful poem. Governance, indeed, is uh, a very important uh, topic to start this um, session with, and we really appreciate. Uh, you all are welcome to the third episode of the UN Civil Society Delegate Stories. And today we are going to be joined by amazing speakers from different countries. We'll be talking on different SDGs. And just stay tuned. Tell a friend to tell a friend to either join us live on Facebook or on YouTube. My name is Minen Pongwe. I am a Cameroonian based in Senegal, and I'm going to be moderating today's session. So we are going to dive directly into the program where I'm going to be bringing our speakers on board. And the first speaker is Judy. Judy, please, can you do a brief introduction of yourself? Uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you're receiving us from. My name is Judy Magu, and I'm a medium project management consultant. And also uh, in, advice, in development advisory, I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya, and also I'm the co-founder of Youth Connect Hub and Global Development Network uh, Foundation. All of them, we are based in Nairobi, Kenya, and our work mainly is to educate our communities giving them uh, soft skills, professional skills, and life skills that are able to help them to, you know, get sustainable livelihood. So I'm excited to be here. And yes, we are pushing SDG1, which is eradicating poverty. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Judy. You're welcome. I've actually noticed that most of our speakers are from East Africa. And so here it is, I'm saying habari to you all. You're welcome to this session. And the next person to do a brief introduction of himself is going to be Davis. Davis, you have the floor. Yes, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are in the world. My name is Gail Davis and I am uh, with the UN and the United Nations in several capacities. I'm not a staff member, but in several capacities and I work across all stakeholderships. My focus is the arts, culture, music, sports, and well-being, and also climate, and also fulfilling on the sustainable development goals. My intention is to focus on sustainable cities and communities and why arts plays a huge contribution to that fact. And the, and the importance of paying artists for their arts and their talents. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. We really appreciate you. you have a very rich profile there. So before we get into the discussion proper, I'm going to be bringing in Peter, who is our leader and the brain behind this amazing program. Peter, you have the floor. I'm trying to find the floor, Minette. So seems like I'm losing here. I will try. I will see if I can find the floor, my friends. But yeah, nice to see you, everybody. Nice to have you all on board. Um, I'm also trying to, to bring something on the screen, and I'm sure you guys can see that. Just confirm you can see it, Minette. All right. Again, I know Minette has done the welcoming, and all guests have done their bit of good introduction. So call me Peter meeting me for the first time, it's going to be exciting. It is going to be very, very interesting. So this year around May, uh, a group or a number of organizations gathered at the UN Civil Society Conference. And just last week, I was reading through things and I saw a report that came out, Minette, Gail, Judy, and everybody, maybe you saw this report. 
which states that only 17% of the sustainable development goals are on track. 18 are sort of in there, and then 30 are in like marginal progress, and then we have 18 again in stagnation, but again 17 are in regression. Yet, we have to achieve all these sustainable development goals by 2030. So during this conference, there was a lot of things that were, were discussed in terms of mobilizing actions and getting people to take actions to, to achieve or probably help toward the, towards the attainment of the sustainable development goals by 2030. And you can see actually who participated. The civil society organization going beyond over 2,000, um, 115 nationalities, 1,400 organizations across the globe. And those statistics are online. You guys can visit them. And again, looking at the representation in terms of gender, in terms of the organizations, age groups, it's all there on the civil society organizational website. But this is the big part. I love this part. And I know Minette, uh, Judy, Gail, and all our guests today will be smiling. There was two things to come out from the civil society, society conference. The impact coalition. And there was a report as well. So there are a number of impact coalitions that were formed before, during, and even some are coming up now. If you look at the list there, there are 20, 20 impact coalitions that were already in existence when we were in Nairobi. And I think this one is going to be one of the biggest impact coalitions based on what we are doing in terms of getting people working on SDGs with our aim of mobilizing people passionate about specific SDGs and then going out there and bringing their members to start now taking actions towards those SDGs. So you get where I'm coming from, my friend. So that's why we had Judy coming on with lots of project advisory, guiding, and she's passionate about SDG one, no poverty. Judy wants to eradicate poverty. And then Alina, our guest who is experiencing some internet issues somewhere, she might not come on, but she's championing SDG 10, reduced inequality. Sorry, I'm actually here. Oh, okay, Alina, Hello. thank you, thank you. I, I never knew you were there. I was just smiling behind the scene and knowing like you are, you are, you are, your internet didn't work, but I'm glad you are there. So Alina comes, comes on to represent SDG 10. And then we got Gail joining us to represent sustainable cities and communities. Obviously, Minette will always be our host to take us through a number of things, and I know Nitya is also in the room. So, Minette and Nitya, over to you. Take us somewhere. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you so much for that detailed analysis of everything that is actually uh everything that was achieved or everything that was done at the UN Civil Society Conference in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, before we dive into the questions, I'm going to just bring in Alina to do a brief introduction of herself. Alina, you're welcome. Thank you. I am just trying to update my screen. However, you guys will have to excuse me for the time being. I will figure out the background shortly. Hi, everyone. My name is Alina Kaimamsama from Zambia. I've joined you a little bit late because we're currently experiencing load shedding. Normally, my schedule is not this hectic, but they cut me off early. So Peter and I were scrambling on how to get me back online. But moving on, I am the founder of an organization called AfriHer. Um, somebody's just asked me to turn on my camera. Can everybody see me? Yes, we can see you now. Right on. Brilliant. So my name is Alina Karimam Sama from Zambia. I am the founder of a non-government organization called AfriHer. Today, I will be representing SDG 10, which is Reduced Inequalities. AfriHer exists to empower Africa's most at-risk communities, but yet greatest resources, which we believe are her youth, which account for 70% of our entire continent's population, as well as the women who drive the economic factor and forces. And we do this by erecting youth hubs where we create equity 
and young people, women and members of the community, whether native Zambians or refugees, whoever it is, can come and access free SRHR services. They can come and take part in any of our free programs at the Youth Hub. Um, for instance, entrepreneurial capacity building, which then allows them to get access to flexible funding. And I'm also the founder of VentureCon Africa, a youth-led venture capital initiative specifically tailored for young entrepreneurs between the ages of 14 to 35. And we have young investors also. I have gotten to work with the British Royal Family through a charitable organization called the Queen's Commonwealth Trust, in which I assist them with fundraising and just general visibility. And getting to work with them and the platforms that I have had access to, the networks I have access to, whether it's from philanthropic millionaires or global renowned celebrities has given me access to this rich network beyond my wildest dreams or imaginations. And in a time where my country is so big on exporting our talent and our skills, I wanted to bring these investments and opportunities back to the motherland, back to my home country. And that's what VentureCon Africa does. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You're really doing a lot. And most of the times I always tell my friends that women inspire me a lot because they are very action oriented. Aside of just being action oriented, they are always very considerate whenever they are maybe implementing any projects because they say women are mothers and mothers are caring. Thank you so much. You really have a rich profile and you are really doing a lot for your country and the continent in general. So we are going to dive into the questioning right now. And I'm going to start with Judy. From Judy, I'll go to Davis. And Davis, I'll come back to you, Alina. So uh, Judy, please. Um, Having participated at the UN Civil Society Conference in Nairobi, what did you gain from the conference? What did you like? And how do you think such conference can be made inclusive for all? Um, thank you. Well, the Civil Societies Conference was a very interesting platform because we were able to, you know, interact with people who are from different, uh, you know, countries, people experiencing different uh, challenges. But at the same time, it was amazing just to see how these people would come together and be able to have a common goal of, you know, of of making the world a better place, of having their communities transformed or their nations or whatever it is that was of interest. And I remember at some point we had a, like a, a place where we were sticking and asking them questions on what exactly, what is the future that they want, whether it's for their countries, whether it is for their you know families or whether it's for their communities. And you could see all of them were inclined towards eradicating poverty, whether it was, uh, for who are advocating for human rights issues, others were advocating for economic empowerment. And it was just amazing, right from the children to the young people to the elderly, all of them had a common voice. They wanted a better world. They wanted a world where people's rights were, you know, were taken into consideration, where people are not exploited, where people are free to operate, you know, to do business and just to exist and to be able to, you know, bring out the uttermost. So it was a very interesting, it was a learning platform for us. And I remember after leaving that conference, I was not able to attend the second day because I was unwell. But I remember going back now to, you know, to the notes and just asking myself, how can I make, uh, you know, my community, you know, a better place? How can I put into action all these things that, you know, I learned from the different people, whether it was through arts, because there were forums for arts and all those kind of engagements. And, I was challenged to bring together the young people and the elderly persons so that they are able to collaborate and to work together and to meet each other's needs. So there was a lot of take homes from the conference and I, it is my desire and it is my prayer that some of those things are going to be actioned. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. The conference was indeed a learning experience because myself, I was so inspired when I left the conference, like the creativity, especially the act and craft session, like just bringing in those innovative ways where people can actually leverage to like maybe just create a solution or help people just understand a particular solution is very, very uh, 
important. Thank you so much for your contribution. And now I'm coming to you, Davis. I'm going to send the same question to you. Having participated in the UN Civil Society Conference in Nairobi, what did you gain, what did you learn? And how do you think that conference or such a conference can be made inclusive? Well, first thing, Minette, I don't know if you know, my name is Gail Davis. Davis. Gail. 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 Gail, okay. sure. Yeah, so it's Thank just you. Gail. Th thanks a lot, Manette. So going to the conference was interesting for me because the first three days my bags were gone. So <laughs> I, I lost my bags and tried to make the best of it and found myself working physically in the communities with Kenya, the people of Kenya. So I was actually working on the ground, working in the soil, working in the agriculture, with them because it was one of those days I think you had a tree day and during that time since I had no clothes I was not going to go to the conference looking terrible I'm not going to lie to you there were no clothes no toothbrush no anything and here I'm staying at an amazing hotel but I have no clothing and one of the things I learned from that was well I did go to the conference of course and I showed up you know twice but I said to myself the whole point of this conference is for us to really be on the ground doing the work. And so I went on the ground and I started going to different locations. I went to certain areas that people would consider slums. I don't like to use that word, but I went there and I started helping to plant trees and working with the people on the ground. I even helped some of the communities plant their gardens and plant for strawberries, not strawberries, for fruits and things like that. So I felt great that I was doing the actual work. And then when I got my bags back, I was in a meeting at the UN on the arts because that's what I focused on. My start started with Quincy Jones and others. And what I wanted to focus on in the arts is not just rambling about the arts need to be in the UN, the arts need to be the UN. I speak with ambassadors, I speak with everybody every day, but I don't like to do a lot of talking. We do the experience and we actually bring artists to the table. We've actually paid the artists ourselves for anything, any art forms that they do. And we especially inform youth that they can charge for whatever arts that they create. And we have brought artists to the table with other member states, other countries, other NGOs to work together so that they create together and they're fulfilling on their missions together. So. What I walked away with from this conference is the importance of stakeholdership and working together and really collaborating on the ground. Thank you so much, Guy. First of all, I want to say sorry about the things that got me, your things that got missing. I'm so sorry about that. But I was really touched by the fact that you really went to the community, helped in planting trees. I think you were actually one of the people that really like created impacts because the rest, we just went and sat, had those discussions and left without doing anything impactful. So I'm really motivated by what you did. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. So, yeah, thank you. I'm coming now to you, Alina. Um, having participated at the UN Civil Society Conference, what did you learn? How was the experience for you? And how do you think such a conference can be made inclusive? Thank you. So for the UN Civil Society Conference, I was actually a subcommittee lead for the youth and intergeneration. I was an expert on that. And I got to work with an incredible team. I think that was one of the highlights for the entire conference for me was being able to connect with other like-minded people and just the network that it has provided me. And we're already talking about collaborations. As a young person running a youth-led organization with limited access to funding, that's very important. We depend highly on collaboration and partnerships. So being able to create that and knowing that the impact will last longer and exceed the lifeline of the UN Civil Society Conference and the impact will extend to people that didn't even get to attend the conference because of the team that I was working with is, is the highlight for me that I want to start with. And the second, what I also enjoyed was 
how engaging it was. It was really curated by people in civil society. Um, we got to decide on, there was so much decision-making that we were part of the process. And we got to say, this is how we want this conference to be. This is our conference. What do we want to come out of it? What, what is most important for us? We got to create messages to people that were going to attend civil society and beyond that. So we got to extend all of that. I think that it could have been way more exclusive inclusive than it was it did feel like it was a little bit exclusive to the people that could afford to travel um, the people that had access to funding or the people that had access to some social media and were following people that were in attendance in in future it would be nice to see it become a hybrid event in person as well as online where full participation for somebody coming from Chibolia in Zambia and can doesn't even have access to a passport can still participate in this conference as well as somebody who perhaps isn't able to travel because of the busy schedule Thank you so much, Alina. I really like the way you articulate your points. It really shows that you were really fully involved and the fact that you're also advocating for the fact that it should be hybrid and not just hybrid in such a way that they just like live stream for other people to view, but it should be hybrid in a sense that other people can also effectively participate despite the fact that they are not there. Because I really know a lot of young people that are so talented, they have a lot to offer, but they were not having the means to participate. They were not even having funding. They were not even like having the uh, accreditation as to have access into the UN. So I think if some of those gaps are maybe closed, you know, if there are solutions that can really help people to participate, despite the fact that they don't have the means to be there, it will go a long way to like really bring change because a lot of people have a lot to offer, but they don't just have the platform. Thank you so much. We are going to move to the second question, and I'm coming back to you, Judy. According to a 2024 report on the SDGs, 17% 17, 17 of the SDGs are on track, 18% on moderated progress, 30% on marginalized um marginal progress sorry 18 percent on stagnation and 17 percent on in regression why do you think this is happening this way and what can you recommend all right i think the realization of the sdgs is, is a collaborate it's, it's a collaboration of you know of different factors and different you know different people and whether it's a government whether it's a community it's a it's, it's a holistic approach that is needed to be able to you know to realize it and i think some of the issues that kinder it is uh, issues of corruption that are happening let me speak from a local level you know before we get to even the advanced level of policies and everything but i feel that issues to do like with corruption and also not being able to understand some of the needs that are currently on the ground especially like for us who are doing like projects and programs here on the ground, not really understanding what is the need of the people when it gets to uh, eradicating poverty and what are the resources that these people have that they can be able to, you know, to tailor make and get solutions for the issues that are affecting them so that we're not just imposing uh, solutions to them, but they can be homegrown solutions to poverty and to issues that, you know, are affecting our communities at an at a family level or, you know, at, at, at whatever level. So I think, first of all, if we are able to understand the needs of the people, then we are not going to impose to them, you know, projects that, that, you know, that they cannot resonate with, that they cannot own. And that is why you see issues of, you know, embezzlement of funds and corruption coming in, whether it's from the leaders or, you know, the different people that, that are involved in the development issues. Um, another thing is, you know, people not being able to understand, not being able to understand, you know, maybe the what exactly they need, the approaches that they need to be able to realize some of these goals. And also, I feel also the disconnect between some of the, you know, the the development agencies and the people and the people on the ground in terms of now making policies that are relevant, because you will find that. The development agencies, you know, have a certain perception and they have certain strategic, you know, goals and objectives that they are looking to achieve. While on the ground also, there are certain objectives that need to be go to, to be achieved. So that misalignment 
brings that kind of a disconnect and it becomes very hard now to be able to read fr from the same script and have the same vision of you know bringing that transformation that is needed by those specific people. So I think the moment we are able to align what is at the, at the global strategic level with the needs on the ground, I think we shall be able to you know to achieve some of those uh, some of those uh, goals. I think that's my take. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. I really agree with you on the fact that development agencies have to really work in collaboration with the population, like the, those who are on ground, because, you know, most of the times any solution that focuses on global narrative is not always like sustainable. So they are evidence based issues that needs a specific solutions. And we cannot achieve a global impact if we don't take local steps or if we don't start from our local uh, community. Thank you so much. And I'm coming back to you, Gail. Following the statistics on the 2024 research on SDG, what do you have to say about it? I'm gonna start in a very different way. Sustainable cities and communities. So I usually deal with all the SDGs, but Peter said we only could do one. So I chose that one. But what I'm gonna say to you is let's start with one area. Start with self. Because before you start pointing over to the global side, you got to get really local, local into yourself. You are the person who can make the change and the shift, not even change. Because you change your name, you're still the same person. No, it starts with you shifting, shifting your direction, shifting your mindset. If you're an insecure person and don't want to collaborate, that's not going to work. And it's not going to help your country, your family, or yourself. Let's look at Kenya, okay? We are passing over what's happening in Kenya. Kenya is a melting pot for what's going to go on in the world. Okay? Young people and old people are fighting each other. Okay? Young people don't want to hear certain things. Okay? But the fact is an eight-year-old can't do what you're doing right now, Manette. Okay? So w older people have wisdom, but you have wisdom too. We have to come together and stop fighting one another because that's how you sustain a city. That's how you sustain a community. We need to sit down first, number one, speak with each other, find out what the needs are. And you can't cure it in just one part of the country. You've got to identify everything across the entire country. Civil society cannot do it by themselves. Private sector cannot do it by themselves. Arts and creativity cannot do it by itself. Um, ambassadors cannot do it by itself, neither can governments do it by itself. But when it starts with the person sitting in the chair on their butt, you can then now look at where you are and begin to reach over to the next person and collaborate. That is the local side. So when we look at where Kenya is now, where the youth are not being respected and they were protesting peacefully, and the government has their side of what they're looking at, they need to really listen to what the young people have to say and where they're going. This is why those statistics are where they are, because we are not really working together. We get on these Zooms and everything else, and we talk a lot, but we don't really work together. We want to shout from the high horse, this one's not involved, that stakeholder's not involved. But what work are you really doing? And not have it be about yourself to cure your own insecurity, but really be on the ground doing the work, talking to your officials, and working with other organizations. Bottom line, that's my thing. Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I could not just hold back. Like the wisdom, your, I don't know, you're so, so experienced. I really like the way you handled that question. Like talking about collaboration, bringing in the intergenerational aspect is very important. And the fact that you brought in the example of what is happening in Kenya, it really shows that you are not just like focusing on a particular country. You're actually just bringing out some of the issues that needs to, like people need to learn from, because I really believe that there's really, uh, like, I don't know how to put it, but young people just have to also understand that they cannot do it alone, same as the old. So we need to yeah. collaborate with one another in order to achieve the goals. But the other people also have to understand that we are in a Gen Z generation. So things are not definitely supposed to be the way they want it to be. 
so together, I think we can really work together to like. But really here, Manette, if I may say one thing, we've got to get out of this thing of if someone wins and someone loses, we give the same prize. No, the one that loses has to understand that they have to learn and gain more wisdom to get there with the winner. And I'm talking about in any situation. And yes, Gen Z does have to learn because some of the things from the old do work, just like some of the things that Gen Z knows works. But there was a time we didn't talk about old and young. We just worked together. And that's what we need to stop highlighting young and old and come together. We need to work it together. And another thing, I just have to say this, this is what we don't talk about. We don't talk about people who are in the NGO space or the member state space or the other spaces that are really undermining one another, that are trying to beat the other one to the other one and making it all about their agenda. We've got to stop doing that. And that's the only way things are going to happen in working together and that these stats go up to 100%. That's the end of what I have to say. Thank you so much. Let's work together to make the world a better place. Let's work together to achieve the SDG. Thank you so much, Gail. You're really a blessing to us today. Thank you. I'm coming now to the beautiful Alina. Alina, how are you? I'm doing well. I love everything Gail has said and Judy. Judy, you left very little for the rest of us to touch on, by the way. Gail's passion, I can feel it from Zambia. And Minette, you touched on a really important topic as well, that the youth are here and we do have, we are not just beneficiaries, right? We're demanding to be stakeholders at the table. We're demanding that uh, leaders meet our demands with what is inclusive for us, what solutions are working for the new generation, but it does take intergenerational collaboration. Like we need intergenerational experts to understand why things have been done this way for so long. And they need us to understand what is working now and what can be improved. Sure, thank you so much. So following the research, uh, maybe the statistics that I just uh, outlined earlier, what do you think is actually making the SDG maybe slow, or what can you actually just recommend based on your favorite SDG? So I think what has led the SDGs to slow track so much, just to add to what my previous co-speaker Judy has said, brilliant points again, and Gail, is the additional factors, the pandemic. The pandemic really slowed the progress we were making towards the SDGs. And then, of course, there is everything concerning the effects of climate change, you know, and we haven't yet achieved peace. There's so many wars and conflicts currently right now. We can talk of Congo, we can talk of Sudan, we can talk of Palestine, we can, there's so many wars and conflicts going on in the world right now. How can we say, let us come together and the SDGs require collaborative effort. It is not individual. It is not that one country has achieved this. They're global sustainable development goals. So we all need to be on board. So how can we now say, let us all come together and achieve this by 2030 if we haven't even achieved peace yet? There is no peace and until we can achieve peace and ceasefires and all of this, then the SDGs will not be realized by 2030. This is our rude reality. Indeed. And just to add to what Gail said about it taking collaborative effort yeah. and what I have said about the SDGs not being individual goals. Again, we can't achieve this if there's still multiple indigenous communities that don't understand that the SDGs exist, that don't understand what the SDGs are, even though they may be already working towards the SDGs without knowing. They're already taking care of the oceans. They're already taking care of the planet. They're already doing their part, their individual parts, a collective part as a community. They need to be on board with what the SDGs are. We need proper funding for the SDGs as well. What and it's also very hard to keep track of the data because there's so many ways that data is being collected towards the SDGs. Is this method, is this organization, but all of these factors play a crucial role in why we have backtracked or there's slow progression towards achieving the SDGs. Yeah, you're very right, Alina. You know, I was actually telling a friend yesterday that I think in order to maybe achieve the SDG, they should focus also on 
data governance. They should focus on research because sometimes you people focus more on solutions rather than understanding the problem. Sometimes the problem is just ignorance. It can just be, especially like in our local communities in Africa, most people don't even actually understand the SDGs. And someone will tell you, now I'm working on women and gender. I don't work on SDGs, which is really funny. So I think we the should focus on it. On, yeah. Sorry. The thing about it is everyone, um, there's so many young people I know within my various networks that are creating impact, social impact, this and that. Everyone is working towards some kind of SDG. Whether you know it or not, you're working towards an SDG. You're just not aware of which SDG. You don't have a niche. And just like Gail, I'm involved in several SDGs, but for this particular conversation, I chose SDG 10, Reduced Inequalities. And it's also important to, sometimes it's okay to focus on the one SDG, this is one, or three or two, whichever it is, right? But everyone around us is working towards an SDG and they just don't realize it. So more education still needs to be done on what are the SDGs yeah. in 2024? Okay. How will we get there in six years? How, how are we actually going to get there? I know the pandemic actually affected a lot of people, a lot of things as well. But it's just that maybe it's because it was really maybe one of the first pandemic that this our generation actually witnessed. Because there are some epidemics that are also very deadly, more than even the pandemic. So sometimes I think we have to just educate our people on how to be resilient despite what is happening around them because Africa in general is undergoing all types of crises, the uh, social political crisis, we have other crises like natural crisis or the flooding is like Kenya is actually facing everything right now. They had flood issues a few months ago and now they are dealing with political crisis and stuff like that. So how can there be progress when the economy, the country is not stable? So we all just have to work together in order to like achieve this. So I'll continue with you before I go back to Judy so that you just rest a bit. So how do you think we can get back on track? What can you recommend? The first thing is inclusion is a very big part and also equity, which SDGs need um, the most urgent attention? Like, can we give those a focus? It's the first of, on my priority list, just as I have ex expressed is peace. How can we band together, come together to achieve the SDGs if we don't have peace? The second is the earth climate. We will not have an, uh, okay, we achieved the SDGs by 2030, all right, but we are killing the earth. Can we save the planet? Can we, certain SDGs need to be, they are all important. I cannot stress that enough. All the SDGs are important, but certain SDGs need to be prioritized over others right now. It is an urgent matter. And the next is onboarding indigenous communities and people at grassroots level. SDGs to be achieved is one key word, implementation, which could be synonymous to action. But that's how we get the SDGs. It's not just by talking about them, sensitization, education on the SDGs. We need to implement and act on the solutions. We need indigenous knowledge and communities. They understand Indigenous knowledge is so crucial <laughs> to our livelihoods, to sustainability. Indigenous knowledge is crucial to sustainability. We need to onboard them. And we're not just talking about, let's go into the com indigenous communities and countries or whatever it is and educate them on the SDGs. Let's go and also learn from them. How do we implement it together? And then there's so many young, young people are such a force. I'm a young person. I might not be in the next 20 years, but right now I sure as hell am. And I will like root for all the young people. We have so much fire and energy and we're just ready to save the world. We're ready to work together. We're ready to collaborate, to partner, all of that, right? And so how can I, in my capacity with my organizations, how can I contribute significantly to attaining or achieving the SDGs if I'm not getting the correct funding? It's not a, a cheap uh, journey to achieve the SDGs. It requires investment and not just investment in sensitization, but on the ground, right? So I'm working with people at grassroots level and we need to implement this. We need to be properly funded for it. 
I cannot be bootstrapping uh, my, with my organization until this or that happens. You need to create proper accessible funding for young people and intergenerational as well or led organizations that are working on the ground to achieve SDGs and not just these huge organize, global organizations that we see all the time that already have funding because perhaps they're founders of philanthropists. Yeah. Thank you so much, Alina. You've hit the nail on the head. Like the aspect of funding is really something that we have to maybe spotlight more. And most of the times I also always tell people that sometimes just request for funding for research, because if you bring out the exact issues that are happening in your community, people will be able to like maybe propose solutions that will solve those specific issues. So sometimes it's not just about educating people, it's about trying to know what exactly the people in a particular community need in order to like be able to meet their specific needs. Thank you so much. I'm coming out to you, Judith. Um, what do you really think can be done differently to get back on track with the SDGs? I will maybe possibly achieve the SDGs by 2030. I think, okay, thank you. I think let it just first of all become an individual responsibility so that I am not looking at Gail, I'm not looking at Alina, I'm not looking at my government leaders just to, you know, to steer this process. But let me be part and parcel of, you know, of taking lead in making sure that, you know, these SDGs are achieved. Because I think for the longest time we've been sitting back and waiting for somebody else to realize this. But I think right now we need to come in now and say, I am going to steer this. And you will realize when I steer this process and then Alina is steering the process and Gail is steering the process, we will realize that we will be able to achieve those goals. But you cannot sit back and say the ones that have funding are the ones who are going to achieve this. So, and, and let us not hold back and say, okay, because I do not have funding, I cannot achieve this. We've been able to transform the lives of our community members with the resources that are at their disposal whether it's agriculture, whether it is, you know, whether it is the skills that they have in, in you know, in, in, in soap making and things like in shampoo making and stuff like that. Let us be innovative. Let us look at what is it, what are the capacities that are within us and around us and work with that and begin running with that as we wait for the big funding to come, as, as we wait for support from other areas. Because, um, I mean, this waiting is what has caused now our young people to get in the streets because you know they are, they are frustrated. There are no opportunities, there are no jobs, their parents are also frustrated. And you can imagine now, you can't pass now this frustration to the next generation and to the other generation. The other thing also we need to understand is the language that we speak to each other. I think like if our young people and our older persons are able to have a common language that they can speak, I believe with the resources that they have in between the two demographics, they'll be able you know, to achieve so much because elderly persons have got the wisdom. They even have the lesson learned of some of the things that did not work and what you know, can work. That wisdom can be passed to our young people. And also our young people are tech savvy. They are so good. They have very smart and innovative, you know, uh, you know, ideas and concepts that can be able, you know, can be able to, you know, be used to steer some of these development issues. So I believe if, this, if these two groups can come together and have a common language, because I always feel that there is a disconnect. They're not able to understand one another. One is... That is where I think where we, we normally lose it. If we are able to get a common language where they're able to speak, I believe we shall be able to steer some of these development goals. Thank you. Indeed, Judith. Um, do you know why I'm laughing? I'm actually laughing because during the UN Civil Society in Kenya, someone told me that he feels so left out because he's not tech savvy, like he's not tech smart. So he feels like, most of the people that are going to bring the change we actually need are young people. But then they cannot do it alone without the wisdom of the old. So it's something that is really, really important that we should just maybe sports like more, just make the older people know that we are not there to like challenge them or we don't want to take over anything. We just want to work together. We just want to bring what we have in order to leverage on their experiences or their wisdom to push or bring the change we all need. Thank you so much for this powerful contribution. I'm coming now to Gael. Gael, 
following the statistics, what do you have to say? I don't want to uh, lay more emphasis on the question because I know you already have a lot to say. So you have the mic. Not 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 not, 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 not necessarily, because sometimes it's not about saying a whole lot, okay? It's really about the actions that you take. And everybody talks about actions. Going back to what Judy said and what I said earlier, it starts with the person. It starts with, you know, everyone has insecurities, okay? Like you talked about the young person or the older person who wasn't tech savvy. Everyone has insecurities. And everybody cannot be in each other's world because they don't have the capacity to engage with each other. There is a, you know, I'm going to say the things that people don't want to hear and say. Me personally, I have been attacked for doing things that other people do and whatever, because I'm quiet. 90% of what I do is not on social media. And I have the young people that work with me saying, now we've got to put out there what we do on social media. I work in the arts. I've worked with everyone from Quincy Jones to Gladys Knight, Barry White, Katy Perry, and a whole lot of other people. But at the end of the day, what does that give me? Okay. It doesn't pay my rent. It may have paid the rent at the time, but it doesn't pay the rent now. Okay. We don't talk about the spiritual side, okay? We don't talk about the emotional, mental, the physical, the financial. You've got to locate yourself within those five areas and be the actual shift you want to see out there. You can't talk about arts needs to be put into something and you haven't fed artists. I have fed artists. I fed artists during COVID and before COVID. I fed them from the farm to the table. That's sustainable cities and communities. I have fed people that didn't have more and I didn't have a lot of money. Number two, we're talking about the youth. Why demand something and fight for something? Begin to engage as though it's there and create the partnership. Because while you're fighting for something, the focus is on fighting for it and not the actual work you're doing to come together to solve the doggone issue. Okay? Because we're too busy fighting for it. And in terms of what a lot of young people do is they go and get something from a young, the older person and then want to implement it. I, as an older person, don't owe anybody any wisdom. They have to get that wisdom on their own and grow into it. I feel young people should have the life they want to live. I feel they should be able to do the things that they want to do. Stop worrying about where this world is going and just create the kind of life you want because any life that you create is going to sustain this world. Okay? You don't have to go out and fight, fight, fight. And to the young lady with, uh, I think, after her, I want to say to you, you don't have to wait for any funding. You go ahead and you create the life you want and you go ahead and do what you want to do. Young people, live the life you want. Do the things that you want because my mother allowed me to grow up doing the things that I wanted. And I didn't wait on an older person. I also knew that an older person owed me nothing. And I don't owe the world nothing. I choose to make the difference in the world that I do because I feel that that's only right to make the difference with others. Some people may not want to do that, so don't force them because this earth is going to be here when we're dead and gone and reinvigorating itself and restoring itself no matter what. And we talk about the indigenous. The indigenous are smart. They're already living the 17 goals. They know what they are every day. We talk on platforms, but we don't get it. And some of you guys may not like what I'm saying, but I'm going to tell it like it is. At this stage in my life, and even when I was younger, I still told it like it was. And again, that's my opinion. And everyone has an opinion like, you know, they have a rear end. So my whole point is do what's important to you. Come together with like-minded people the way you want to. But young people live your life on your terms but allow yourself to learn and gain the wisdom. And that's what will fulfill on the SDGs because it, naturally people will come together based on what's important to them and connecting what's important to them. Thank you. I'm not sure, Minetta, that's what you wanted to hear, but I'm not going to say what everybody wants to hear. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gaia. Uh, I'm not actually particular about your response because you are not talking to me. You're educating the whole public. A lot of people are going to watch the rebroadcast. So I'm really happy that you're very intentional and very focused on what you want to say and not allowing people or anything around you influence your decision. Your opinion is very important. Thank you so much for your great contribution. Well, Minette, I want to say something to you before I go. It's not about like you said about you, it's about 
you and every single person sitting in the seat, choosing the direction you want to go in your life and knowing that any direction you choose is a contribution. And thank that's you it. So much. All right. Thank you so much. So now we are going to take the last question. So I will bring in Alina. Uh, Alina, what do you think can be done to achieve your favorite SDG? I know you also have some contributions to add to your question four. So you have the mic over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm going to start with what Gail just, just referenced uh, to me. I am the young woman founder of Afriher. I have never <laughs> waited for funding. I'm 26 and I have gotten to create, not just build youth hubs, but schools. We're building a STEM academy in Malambanyama. All of my organization's impact and work has been created from my social enterprise. So when I speak now more in my reflections, I'm speaking from the position that I'm speaking, representing other young people who can't be at the table today, who don't know Peter, who can't be nominated to speak on this platform and have their voices heard. And all of these issues are real. There's access to funding is a very real issue. Some people are not business savvy like I am. I started my enterprise when I was 16. By the time I was 20, I had won a 200,000 business pitch competition. Before I won that business pitch competition, I had already made my first 100K. I've already made a 3 million deal, 1 million deal, but that's in Kwacha. So I'm not sure when you convert it to USD exactly what it will be. I have multiple, <laughs> I have, I have multiple enterprises and how I do my part is I only employ young people. I employ experts who are intergenerational. So as an expert, it doesn't matter your race, age, gender, whatever you identify as, as long as you're an expert in this field. But most of my team are young people specifically coming from rural, remote or peri-urban communities because that, that is the genesis of my story, right? And I'm able to be here. I am who I am today because my mother was empowered with education. And I know that that is a key factor. And it goes back to everything we're saying goes back to educating people and the SDGs, education, yeah. and what are the solutions and this and this and that. But that's that's the work I do with Afriher. Um, all the work that we have done, 80% has been self-funded. We have had partners with FHI 360, USAID, but what they've given us in funding could never match what we've been able to generate from our social enterprises. And that I'm very proud of that. And I just feel like um, listening to Gail speak, is, it just has given me so much fire. I love everything that you have been saying and agree with everything that you have been saying. And yes, now to answer the next other question on reduced inequalities. Firstly, equal opportunities. And we can't speak of equal opportunities when there are so many inequalities. So there's this thing called equity. To get to reduced inequalities, we need to start with equity, right? Which goes back to my previous uh, proposal of prioritizing some SDGs over the others. We're not saying now give it when we're educating the girl and boy child, for example, my organization, we receive so much backlash on why are you focusing so much? We work with young people, which again, whatever your gender pronoun is. And however, we have a specific prioritization on young girls in rural, remote, in the villages, urban communities where there's not so much development in this. We have a lot of focus on girls and women. Our scholarships come number one is we have to give it to a girl before we can give it to a boy. And the reason is very simple. We are creating equity to get to uh, equality, to get to reduced inequality. We need to start with equity. I come from the community where the girl will be told you have to do these chores, learn to sweep, learn to cook, the age old tale, the, that, ne that negative narrative about Africa is also very real, you know, focus on the cooking and the cleaning, help with the house chores, because one day you will marry well, hopefully, and you will need to do this in the house for your husband. I'm a feminist, I was raised by all women, but I still experience this. I was raised by a working mother who had only girl, like daughters, she only had daughters. However, when a male cousin came over, he got to relax. And I was told it is my job to serve him. 
simply because he's a boy. Doesn't matter whether he is older, we are the same age. I have to serve him. It's it's my job and position as a girl. He can spend his time watching something, reading, learning. For me, that would be time wasting, right? That was a very real reality. So when we're dealing with communities where the boy is taught skills, whether it is going to help the family in the field, that is a skill he he is learning that will help set him up economically later in the future. And the girl is told your ambition should be to this. We prioritize equity. It's let us also give education opportunities to the girls. Let us also, so equity, create. That's just a very long example of why it's important to create equity um, if we have to get to inequalities. Equity should be a huge part of the conversation. Equity will lead to inequalities. And then of course there is supporting movements that promise equality or equity. This are youth led movements, continuing them, continue the agenda and discriminatory practices have to come to an end. Um, I'm very passionate about this. This is another area my organization is working in and we need policy reforms that will not just encourage equity, but enforce equity. Thank you so much, Alina. Thank you. Indeed, we need policies. Um, coming now to you, Judith, from the lens of the president of the World Bank Group, what if you were the president of the World Bank Group, like from his lens, what can you do for your favorite SDG to be achieved? Judith. Well, I, I think first of all is, I think policy reforms, because I think policy issues are some of the things that are hindering some of these SDGs from, you know, from being realized. And to, it, when you are like, they're disseminating the resources, you know, whether to the different projects or to the different, different governments, I think it's very important for, you know, for them, first of all, to ensure there is accountability, because when some of these resources are dispersed, they're not they're not serving the need that is intended on the ground. So I think that needs to be put in check so that the resources are not wasted, but are put into proper use for the intended projects on the ground. And also identifying the key areas of need that needs to be prioritized when you're dealing with issues to do with poverty and hardship. And also, I think also another aspect that needs to come out is now building the resilience of the people, whether it is communities, so they can be able to to, to, to withstand the effect of whether it's climate change and you know some of the issues that came after COVID. So it, I think people need to be, that capacity needs to be built so that they are able to build that resilience from a, a community level to the national level and they, they are able to be able to withstand the kind of pressure that is coming in whether with the tough economic conditions. And I think one of the issues that also we're experiencing here in Kenya with the issues of taxations, you know, I think that is an issue that is really affecting the people on the ground. If they are able to somehow cushion, cushion, you know, the taxes so that they are not able to hit so hard on the general, you know, the locals, I think it will make work very easier. It will make it easier for, for people to be able to have a decent livelihood. Because right now people are, I hope you're hearing me, there's so much rain going on. People are, are, are battling right now with just getting bare minimum sustenance, food, clothing, shelter, and yet the taxes are still being imposed right now. So I think if I was sitting in the World Bank, you know, platform, I would ask them, okay, let us come up with ways where we are cushioning the local Kenyan or the local communities so that they're not so hard hit when it gets to the taxes and, you know, ways of paying back some of these loans. And also to check the leaders who they are giving, you know, the loans to or the ones who, who are who are the implementing projects on the ground make sure that they are accountable and also there is issues of integrity thank you thank you so much judith indeed they have to hold our presidents accountable make sure that they are actually implementing those projects when you give out the funds make sure they are using the funds correctly there should be a monitoring and evaluation process that is being done by maybe they stick the, the presidents or the leaders themselves like be able to self-evaluate yourself you cannot be saving the people and not doing the job well like i don't know how to put it but we are really in a crisis uh, era like almost all african countries are going through something including my country cameroon 
So we just hope that things are really going to get better very soon. Yes, like some of the projects uh, that have been, the issues that have been discussed right now at our nation, some of those projects have not even, they can't be, you can't put a finger into some of the projects that we are paying the taxes for. So I think it's really unfair to the common, you know, one inch in Kenya, you call it one inch to the locals. I think it's really unfair and they need to put our interests at heart, you know. Yes. Thank you, Judy. Thank you so much. I'm coming now to you, Gaia. Please, from the lens of uh, a UNZP administrator, you know, that's the development uh, um, I know very well. I'm very, the UN. What can you I'm do for your favorite goal to be achieved? He's someone that I happen to love. Okay. And know very well. Um, and I know the other folks too. Um, and it's not about dropping a name. It's just after being around this space in different spaces for years and it has nothing to do with being older either. It's I always felt that God, and it's not about being religious because I'm not religious. But I do love God and I do love Christ. And it has to do with that God has placed me in different throughout different times and places and spaces. And I didn't know why. Okay. And when this question was brought to me, there was not much I could say. Because to be honest with you, he's doing the job. And that's all I can say. I really, like I said, there's a time and place that you can talk. What I would say is I haven't said a lot about the arts and culture and sports for a reason. And I want the the uh, you and everyone else to know. I have a reason for not mentioning. There will be more coming out. Okay. But I want to speak on one thing in particular if I was a UNDP person. I hear people talking about the government needs to do this for us. This one needs to do that. I'm going to bring it back to us, which what Judy and I were talking about. And I love what the young lady from Afri Her was. I mean, so I'm sitting here listening to her and I'm saying, well, how can I learn from her? Okay. What can I learn from her? And it, and here it is. I'm older than her. I want to know what can I learn from Alina? Okay. What can I learn from Judy? What can I learn from Annette? It starts with the butt in the chair. It starts with the feet on the ground has nothing to do. We all go to the bathroom. We all uh, eat the same way. We all bleed red blood. No one is better than the other. So the point is that if I were, you know, Akim, okay, I would be galvanizing every person, every single human being that breathes air to work together from the two-year-old who's a toddler walking down the street to the hundred and something year old. I would galvanize. But here's the interesting thing. He does that already. A.J. Benga does that already. Okay. These were great leaders that are chosen, but there's so many others that do it. And so that's where I'm going to stop. I don't have any more to say on that one. Thank you so much. We're actually running out of time. Before I come back to you all for your closing shoot, I'm going to bring in Peter for an official closing remark before I come back to you for your last words. Peter. Take the microphone. <laughs> are you there? If you are not yet ready, I think I'll come back to you, Gaia. Gaia, can you just give us your closing, your last words? Maybe just say something. Um, my last words are this. Be authentic. When you say you're collaborating, I don't want to hear, that's why I have all this experience in this space and all that garbage. Be authentic really collaborate with people. Let your ego go. Stop claiming that people are taking things from you or not. Um, and this is to anyone, because I'm seeing this everywhere. Private sector, I'm seeing it in the UN space. I'm seeing it with young people. Really take the time to look at yourself first before you go and open your mouth to work with others, anyone. And stop looking for the other person to do it for you, okay? And look in your life where you're li living all the 17 goals already because you're living the 17 goals every day. So look at where you're living. And the other thing is, if you use art and culture in any way, which you, we all do, to uplift us when they, you go home, then you deserve to pay them, all arts and artists, 
for their works, okay? And not through no damn AI. OK, because AI is about to give us the biggest carbon footprint that will take us out of one point five Celsius that we've ever had. I'm not against AI because I teach AI, but we have to look at how and what we're doing. And young people, this is my direct message. You go and enjoy your life. Go create the life you want to do, because anything you do to make a, a, a difference will make a difference. You do not have to be forced to save this planet. It's going to be here no matter what you do. So if you want to be a football player or whatever, go do it. Okay? Thank you. Thank you so much, Gail. I really, really appreciate it. And I really feel inspired. And I also feel bad because I used to volunteer a lot. I used to do a lot of things for so many CSOs. And I was not even given anything. So I like the fact that you are pushing the narrative of people being paid for what they do. Even the, the artists that they should be paid for all their creativity and other stuff. So I think if that is being implemented, a lot of young people are going to maybe get into the space and do a lot because- But Manette, I just wanna say one thing. I just wanna say one thing to you. Don't worry about volunteering for CSOs. Go live your life and do the things that you want. You're still making a difference with whatever you choose to do in your life. It's no, no, you don't have to volunteer. You could just go sell whatever. Uh, I'm saying sell cars. You know what you just did? You enabled someone to drive one. You're making a difference with whatever you do. So just do you and then do your friends and have a, enjoy your life. You're making a contribution with whatever you do. That is what I'm saying. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Your last word, Judy. Um, I think mine is, first of all, to appreciate everybody because of the processes that we are pushing to restore human dignity. But even as we go out there, let us put our personal interests aside so that we're not driven by by I, but we are driven by what we are looking to, you know, to, to, to do to the people who are around us, whether it is at a family level, whether it's at a community level, whether it's at a national level, whether it's at a global scale. Let us push let us put aside our interests and let us focus on restoring human dignity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Judy. Let us put away our interests. Let's focus on the general goal. Like let's focus on the general public, on the global impact. I really appreciate you coming in today. And now I'm coming back to you, Alina, your last word. Thank you. Um, I had my last words. As soon as you asked girl, I was thinking in my head, what are my closing remarks? But after she spoke, I think that's completely changed because I also feel like that just spoke directly to me as a young person leading an organization. There's so many things I've had to put on hold <laughs> that are just like my, my personal ambitions, my personal aspirations, because I don't think they're benefiting to anybody else that isn't me. So on that note, I would like to say to young people, combining what Gail and Judy have both said to be your most authentic selves and to demand. Minette, just like you, I, I have so much work experience that I got from volunteering and not being paid for years. And when I became unafraid to demand what I was worth, pay me my time, I walked away. And as a young social entrepreneur, I found that walking away is also just as good as not giving up on something. Don't be afraid to move on from something when it's no longer working. If a solution is not working anymore, try a new solution, try a new route. If something isn't working out for you anymore, don't be afraid to let it go. There is so much pain and anxiety and uncertainty that comes with leaving or closing one chapter, but there's so many possibilities that come from exploring a new one. Those are my closing remarks now. Thank you. Um, so Manette, Manette, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to say one thing to what um, uh, Alina said. I Alina, I want to be clear about something I'm saying. We should all be paid for what we do. But there is a period where you do have to do volunteer work. Okay? Where you do, I have youth that can do my job. Okay? And they're not paid. And they will tell you they love their work here. No, there is a place where there's not entitlement. You have to do the work on the ground. And I think that's why, the, yeah. that's why the younger and older generation are having problems. You can't put your time in and expect to be paid for something you never knew. And you're getting the experience from that person. And that's yeah. why I say that 
internship is two ways. It's not one way. Both people are learning from each other. So there's a give and take on both sides. And when you can then put what you've learned into experience and gain the wisdom from it, I don't care what age you are, then we can talk about let's get paid. But artists right off the bat, their creativity is given. They don't have to learn anything. It's given. So it's a little bit of a different curve. Artists need to be paid right away because you're getting the picture you want, the music you want, the sound you want, the beat you want, the sculpture you want. You're getting it in right then and there. So it's a little bit of a different curve. And everyone deserves to be paid for what they do. But most of us in private sector will get that. Mm. As an artist myself, that's important that artists are paid right away, not on some Spotify streaming where they never get paid billions of streams and only $6,000 like Pharrell. That's what I'm speaking to. So I'll leave it there because I know we have to go, but I just wanted to speak on that. And I just wanted to say, Alina and Judy, you are two of the most powerful women that I've met. I'm not just saying that to say that. You're two of the most powerful women that I've met in a long time. And I like that you say what's on your mind and you're not afraid to speak it. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much, Gaia. Indeed, they are very, you all are very powerful women. Like, I think this is the best episode since we started. You can watch the recordings. Trust me, today was so great. It was powerful. The future indeed is female. So now we are going to be having a closing point from Peter. Peter, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. All right. It was a very insightful engagement. Very nice. Thank you for the speakers. But then, listen, as day fades tonight, we lay our heads to rest. Minds bringing, brimming with ideas, our hearts impressed. Not us against them, but a world intertwined. A system accountable with progress in mind. Each person unique with skills of their own. Yet at one table, no one stands alone. We'll fight side by side for a future that's bright. Our differences fading in warm candlelight. Sweet dreams of unity fill our slumber deep. As hope for tomorrow, we tenderly keep. Together we'll rise when dawn gets the sky to build a world where all dreams can fly. Thank you. <laughs> Peter, you have a way of just lifting our spirits with your beautiful points. We really appreciate you coming in today and thank you so much for everything. Uh, try to network with all these beautiful and powerful ladies. You can actually also always maybe speak in when they have their activities, connect with Gael. They are working on the arts and is it crafts conference that is no, coming? No, not crafts. We actually sit with member states and work with them on the arts and how they can solve global issues. We don't talk about it. We don't talk about getting there. We're doing it and have been doing it for the last six, seven, maybe even more years. We're also, we also solve the SDGs in four different countries. So not just with arts. All. So if anyone wants to reach us, it's the Creators 2030, at the Creators 2030. And the last thing I would like to say over to you guys is you just heard Peter, right? He just gave his poem. He didn't have to do any work or do any internship to give his poem, okay? If he was in a, a certain situation, he should be paid right away because he doesn't have to work to do it. He's already done the work by giving his creativity and we're already lifted up. So that's the point of paying him for what he does. I don't mean here, so Peter Armandi, don't get upset with me, but I mean in general that he would be, uh, I'm joking, but, but if he if he was doing this for a country, he should be paid. He doesn't need to get the experience of doing it for a country because his creativity is already there. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gaia. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Alina. Thank you, Judy. But just stay put while uh, Peter comes in with the closing remark. I Peter. think you guys managed to make me happy. So clap for yourself for making me happy. I have a lot of notes and you guys did a good job. So <laughs> to bring it home, the idea here is you see how you are authentic. That is now what we are building with Club 17. I want authentic people. And that's all we want. It's like you come here and you start talking to us, you are collaborating. And when people reach out to collaborate, then you are something else. We just want real people. And that's what we are building. And that's why you came to this platform as first guests and i do i can say i love you guys 
<laughs> because you made me smile. And when I was joining the call, I wasn't happy. And now you can see I'm very much so well done. And thank you, everybody, until episode four. I look forward to engaging you more. So, yeah, that was a good one. I really enjoyed myself.